morning and welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. We're meeting today on two issues. First, we're going to consider the draft final rule to establish safety standards for infant support cushions. Once a decisional is concluded, we'll be briefed on the proposed operating plan for fiscal year 2025, which began on October 1st. But first, the decisional meeting. We're going to start with questions for staff. We have two staff members present to answer questions if there are any. We're joined by Dr. Ashley Johnson, a physiologist in the Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction, and Dave, uh, Mr. David Mateo, attorney in the Office of General Counsel. Each commissioner is going to have five minutes for questions, multiple nouns necessary, and after questions are complete, we'll uh, consider any amendments. As a reminder, if you have questions that address a statutory interpretation or other legal advice, please don't ask them at this time. I'm going to move to questions, and uh, I don't have any questions. I look to my colleagues. Commissioner Felton. I don't have any questions. Thank you very much. Commissioner Trunka. I have none. Thank you. Commissioner Ball. No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Ziak. No questions. Great. Well, thank you all for all your work uh, leading up to this point in time and for being present today. Having uh, no questions for staff, staff's excused, and we're going to move to the consideration of the package. I'm going to entertain any uh, amendments or motions from the commissioners at this point in time. I don't have any amendments. Commissioner Feldman, do you have any amendments? I do not. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Trumka, do you have any amendments? I do have one amendment, which I circulated. Okay, I'm going to uh, recognize you to introduce your amendment for up to three minutes. Thank you. Uh, so the it's a minor one. The, the proposed final rule briefing package added a definition uh, for sidewall and it used the word vertical. Uh, it's clear from the package that's, that sidewalls can be at varied angles and still fall within the term. However, the common definition of vertical uh, is perpendicular to the plane of a horizontal axis or located at right angles to a, uh, the plane of a supporting surface. So to eliminate any possible confusion, the amendment removes the word vertical in several places. I confirm with staff the amendment's appropriate. It removes possible confusion and maintains staff's intent. Is there a second? Second. Here being heard a second. I'm going to now turn to comments and questions from other commissioners, beginning with myself. Um, as you mentioned, I think the, the it's fairly clear from the package and the context, but I don't see a harm in this. So um don't have any particular questions. Uh Commissioner Feldman. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate the amendment. Uh, I'm not sure that it's necessary. Uh, I think the most important thing is that testing labs understand what we mean by vertical, and there's no evidence that I see in the record that there's any confusion on the point. I think dictionary definitions are great. Uh, when you look at Merriam-Webster, it, it, uh, it, it, it defines vertical as perpendicular to the primary axis, but it also includes uh, secondary definitions that are more permissive, including um, situated at the highest point or pointing straight down or nearly so. So I think that there's flexibility to cover all manner of sidewalls under the term vertical. Uh, I, I'm a no on this amendment. Thank you. Chris Wall. Um, I don't have any questions. I do think the package is clear as written. Commissioner Yak. I do not have any questions. Uh, Commissioner Trumka, do you have anything to say in closing? Nope. Thanks for your consideration. All right, uh, with that, I'm going to move to a vote on the amendment. Uh, Commissioner Feldman? I vote no. I vote no. Commissioner Trumka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Ziak? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So the yeses are four, the noes are one, the amendment is adopted. Uh, Commissioner Trumka, did you have any other amendments? I do not. Thank you. Commissioner Boyle, did you have amendments? I don't. Thank you. Commissioner Ziak, did you have amendments? I do not. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we're going to move to the approve the final safety standard for infant support cushions as amended and to direct publication the same in the federal register. Is there a second for that? Second. Having heard a second, we can vote. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, how do you vote? I vote yes. Commissioner Trumka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Ziak? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So the yeses are five, the noes are zero, and the final rule establishing a safety standard for infant support cushions as amended has been approved and shall be published in the Federal Register. So uh, with that, we're gonna move to closing statements on this portion of the uh, decisional. Uh, each commissioner is gonna have up to 10 minutes and I'm gonna recognize myself for the first 10 minutes. So I am actually so pleased that we are here today to approve this rule and that we did so by a unanimous vote. 
This is an important rule that creates safety standards for a set of products that until now have not been subject to comprehensive safety standards and create a suffocation risk for infants. In the early 1990s, the commission banned infant pillows with granular fill that could conform to a baby's face. Since that time, new products have emerged that have served a similar purpose to those of the old beanbag style pillows that fall outside the ban. These include infant loungers, cuddle pillows, head positioning pillows, wedge pillows, uh, infant self-feeding pillows, and more. They feature, uh, the, the feature that they all share is that babies rest or lounge on them, and if they're too soft or pillowy, the baby's faces can become compressed in them, leading to suffocation, and in some cases, death. This rule illustrates a core principle that Congress has confirmed, that if products are made for babies, they should be as safe as possible for their use. It also advanced an important work to improve safety for all durable infant products. I wanna thank the staff for their hard work on this rule, uh, the commenters for providing important information the staff has relied upon in developing the final rule, and for my colleagues for the support, especially note that this has been an, um, an issue that Commissioner Boyle has focused on and provide leadership over the years. So I look forward to going into effect and um, again, thank the staff and my colleagues for making this happen. Now to Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased that today we've uh, worked to finalize a strong mandatory safety standard uh, for these products under our Section 104 authority. Uh, this is a standard that hopefully will save uh, uh, lives, including the, the, the most vulnerable consumers among us, uh, infants and toddlers. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Johnson, Mr. DiMatteo, uh, everybody on staff for their uh, diligent work uh, on this standard. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased that we were able to get to where we are today. Thanks to my colleagues for, for voting to support this. Mr. Trumka. Thank you. Um, just very happy that, that we are where we are right now. Uh, in 2021, 17 babies' deaths were tied to infant support cushions. In 2022, at least that many. Today, we did our most important job, I think, and I think we fulfilled our moral obligation by stopping that from happening to more babies. Every year going forward, 17 or more babies will keep on living who may not have otherwise had that chance. And with today's action, we say no to products that needlessly put babies at risk of death. It's another great victory in our long march to ending all preventable infant uh, product-related sleep deaths. And when you look at this rule, particularly in combination with our recent nursing pillow rule, we're covering the space. There's no daylight for bad actors to sneak around regulation now. So I thank you for everything that you've done to get us here. Well done. Mr. Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do want to add my uh, thanks to everyone who worked on this package. Uh, protecting infants, uh, our most vulnerable population, is the most important work we do. And I appreciate uh, staff in particular your continued dedication. Thank you very much. I don't have further remarks. Commissioner the act. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank our staff uh, for the work that they put into developing this uh, final rule to establish the safety standards for infant support. Uh, products. Uh, I'd also recognize the stakeholders and advocates who shared their expertise and knowledge during the uh, rulemaking process and the collaboration that got us to this important final rule today. I'm hopeful that this rulemaking will improve safety for this class of products, and thus I'm happy to have supported it. Thank you. Thank you again to everybody who worked on this package. Um, at this point in time, that concludes today's decisional meeting of the the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, and we're going to move to the briefing on operating plan once staff has been able to come up to the table and get set up.
At this point, we're going to turn to a briefing from the staff on the proposed fiscal year 2025 operating plan. Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank the staff for the incredible work for the past year. While we're dealing with an array of new challenges, they stayed focused on the mission and delivered key victories for consumers. Following up on testimony we heard from parents about the hazards posed by water beats, staff developed a proposed safety standard that is now out for public comment. We are now focusing on key rules established by congressional mandate, including furniture stability rules under the Sturdy Act and coin cell battery safety standards under Reese's law and enforcing them. The Office of Communications continue to provide uh, communities that experience uh, disproportionately high deaths and injuries from certain products with life-saving information. And we brought a whole of agency approach to hazards posed by lithium ion batteries. Our field staff has worked closely with local authorities to investigate fires when they happen. The communication team provides safety education and anticipates staff will be sending us a draft proposed rule on lithium ion battery safety in micro mobility devices in the coming weeks. And that's just testing the surface of all the things that staff has done and accomplished under tough circumstances this year. Today's briefing will make clear that many of our fiscal and regulatory challenges remain and may worsen in the next year. We're prepared for the possibility of having to operate under flat funding for a second year in a row, but at, uh, this time without support of uh, ARPA funds. In anticipation of this, we instituted a critical hiring initiative and offered early retirement incentives last year, which reduced our staff by about 9%. While this room uh, means that we can continue to operate even as our budget remains flat, it also means that we're stretched thin and risk falling behind in key, key areas, such as our rulemakings and being fully staffed or ports and in the field. This comes at a time when court imposed requirements to release uh, data related to our rulemakings, combined with our statutory obligations to protect individuals' privacy, has slowed our rulemaking agenda and cost the agency time and additional resources. The operating plan we have to, to be briefed on today assumes that we will be funded at the continuing resolution level for the coming year. But it also provides details about how we could spend additional funding if it were provided the full amount requested in our budget that was made earlier in the spring. I look forward to the briefing and discussing how we will uh, best prioritize the limited amount of resources we have. In a moment, I'm going to turn this meeting over to staff so they can brief us. Once they have completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions, multiple rounds if necessary. Leading the briefing today is Austin Schlick, CPSC Executive Director. We're also going to be hearing from Rob Carroll, CPSC's Budget Officer. And additional staff are going to be available to answer the Commission's questions. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Mr. Schlick. Good morning, Chair and Sarek and Commissioners. Uh, last March, the Commission approved a fiscal year 2025 budget request to Congress that identified $183.05 million as a level of annual appropriations that will enable CPSC to protect the public from hazardous consumer products. The draft operating plan before you proposes to allocate funds as described in that budget request if Congress appropriates the full amount for CPSC. Today, though, the agency is operating under a continuing resolution at the level of $150.975 million, $32 million below the pending request. That's the same level of funding CPSC received in fiscal year 2024 and slightly less than in fiscal year 2023, despite substantial pay and other cost increases and new responsibilities given to us by statute. In addition, when the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 provided CPSC uh, $50 million of funding, uh, all but $1.5 million of the ARPA funds has been committed to the purposes Congress identified. In FY 2025, we must be prepared for a level of annual funding that does not offset the end of ARPA's support. 
Given the current CR level, the end of ARPA funding and uncertainty about future appropriations and to avoid an operational crisis if we do not receive an increased annual appropriation, the principal scenario in staff's proposed operating plan is continued flat funding at the $150.975 million level while pay levels and other costs increase. Those assumptions largely dictate the shape of the proposed operating plan. There are no major new safety initiatives, facilities, or systems in the plan. Instead, the work that can be supported is continued incremental progress to reduce known hazards such as infant suffocation and strangulation, carbon monoxide poisoning, and battery fires. Enforcement of CPSC regulations at the ports and through field and legal investigations would continue at slightly reduced levels compared to prior years. We will gradually upgrade, upgrade agency data systems and devices, expand use of machine learning at a deliberate pace, perfect the e-filing technology that is now being trialed, and improve agency accounting, risk management, and personnel practices. We'll be somewhat less able to reach consumers and businesses with safety messaging, and somewhat less capable of sharing information and ideas with other safety agencies around the world. We will look for potential savings from giving back additional office space in Bethesda Towers on top of the 15,400 square feet we returned to GSA in FY 2024. Regarding our most vital asset, CPSC staff, the agency's payroll was reduced deliberately in FY 2024 so that we can operate within our means. At the start of FY 2024, the agency had 571 full-time equivalent employees. Today, after a year of limited hiring, and a successful early retirement incentive program, we have 522 FDE. This 9% downsizing has limited the agency's capabilities, but also positioned us to operate in the foreseeable future without any mandatory force reduction. I'm painting a cautious picture here, which I think is appropriate, but it's equally important to emphasize how effective CPSC has been in directing the resources we do have to meaningfully improving public safety. Through the diligent work and expert work of uh, diligent and expert work of agency staff, many of whom are being asked to take on additional responsibilities due to FTE reductions, there were many major agency accomplishments in FY 2024, as the Chair just noted. The Commission finalized rules to prevent infant deaths and serious injuries associated with nursing pillows and, just this morning, infant support cushions. We're applying machine learning to large data sets that previously could not be interpreted. We have strengthened the NICE hospital network that provides the global gold standard for data on consumer injuries. We're motivating and supporting voluntary standard setting. In FY 2024, we had announced 333 product recalls and assessed more than $25 million in civil penalties. We screened approximately 75,000 import shipments for hazardous consumer products and removed more than 5 million units of hazardous and violative products from commerce. We, imp we implemented a new program established by Congress that awarded over $3 million in grants to 22 states and localities to prevent carbon monoxide poisoning. We also issued more than $2.5 million in pool safety grants to 10 state and local governments to combat drownings and entrapments. These are record numbers. Nearly 33,000 business users relied on the regulatory robot to learn about safety requirements. We delivered our safety messaging with 48 billion impressions, and we secured major litigation victories that defended the Consumer Product Safety Act against interest group attacks. Just imagine what this agency could do with additional funding. I have with me at the table leaders from several of the key offices that participate in preparing this draft operating plan. It will do our best to answer your questions. Uh, we have Dwayne Boniface, head of our Office of Risk Reduction, Brian Burnett, our Chief Information Officer, Rob Kay, who is our Director of Compliance and Field Investigations, and Lavette Wallace, who, had, who leads our Office of Human Resources Management. Other key staff are standing by if needed. But first, CPSC's Budget Officer, Rob Carroll, will describe staff's proposed 2025 operating plan in greater detail. Rob. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Hone, Sarak, and Commissioners. In the FY24 appropriation, the Consumer Product Safety Commission was provided $150.975 million and supported 545 FTE. However, this was a reduction of $1.525 million from the 25 or FY23 appropriation. On March 11, 2024, CPSC submitted the FY25 budget to Congress for $183.05 million to support 607 FTE. The 183 million will allow CPSC to preserve, continue, and expand on existing strategic goals and priorities, as well as address new emerging safety threats from the volatile products to, consum to consumers. As also noted, oh, uh, next slide, please. As also noted, the FY appropriation has not been determined nor enacted. CPSC is operating on a continuing resolution through December 20th, 2024, 
at the FY24 enacted level of 150.975 million. Next slide, please. The FY25 operating plan will prioritize goals and priorities set forth in the Commission's strategic plan and the FY25 budget to Congress. As such, CPSC will continue within the limits of our appropriations to stop hazardous products at our borders, vigorously enforce product safety laws, investigate new existing and hidden hazards, build diversity and seek product safety equity, communicate more effectively to a broader range of consumers, and accelerate necessary modernization of mission critical technology. Next slide, please. As also mentioned, due to the uncertainty about our future appropriations, the principal scenario and a proposed operating plan provides flat funding at the 150.975 million, supporting a target workforce of 534 FTE. In addition, the operating plan provides our alternative but preferred scenario, which supports the FY25 presence budget for 183.05 million, supporting 607 FTE. Next slide, please. This table presents a detail of the budgets and FTE for each of the program offices at the CR and PB level. It also conforms to the change made by the commission on October 8th, 2024 for the realignment of the small business ombudsman and consumer ombudsman from the office of the executive director to the office of communications, a change of four FTE. Next slide, please. The CR funding level provides 4 million for grants of which 2 million are for the Virginia Graham Baker pool and spa safety act and 2 million for the Nicholas and Zachary Burt Memorial Carbon Monoxide Poisoning Prevention Act. The remaining 145.975 million assumes a 2% pay increase as directed by the budget guidance and from Office of Management and Budget, as well as other inflationary increases to support 534 FTE. The outplan recognizes rent savings of $500,000 from the return of 15,000 square feet of office space to GSA and FY24. In addition, the outplan accounts for the realignment of $1.5 million to support three previously ARPA funded recurring projects to the base budget. Next slide, please. These projects include $600,000 for web nice operations and maintenance and to develop the EBI management application or EMA to management incident records and other information. $600,000 for case management system operations and maintenance. And lastly, $300,000 to support email delivery of the agency safety messaging. The remaining four ARPA projects total $1.7 million and include 700,000 for e-filing, 700,000 for SAS licensing and hosting costs, 300,000 for web content management and 100,000 for recall translations. These requirements will completely exhaust the remaining ARPA funding with a shortfall of $200,000 compared to the currently available ARPA balance of 1.5 million. Staff will begin to identify and close out unfulfilled prior year ARPA contracts in hopes of increasing our ARPA funding availability to cure our shortfall. Next slide, please. Uh, if you could go back one slide, yeah, perfect, thank you. As mentioned earlier, without an increase in appropriations, implementing a presently directed pay raise and realigning ARPA projects into the base budget will necessitate re reductions in other non-pay funding. This will limit capabilities of program offices to include a reduction of port investigators and purchases of modern screening equipment, lesser support for litigation to, invoice, uh, to enforce product safety laws, decreased ability for our scientists to investigate new existing and hidden hazards, including chronic and emerging hazards, Reduce capabilities for economic studies, voluntary standard support, and maintenance for the Rockville Lab. CPSC will be unable to develop and implement a customer education campaign specifically targeting chronic hazards. IT capital replacements will be limited, and it might be necessary to lessen support contracts for programming, CPSC's network, public facing website, and help desk. The out plan unfortunately reduces other agency support below what would be funded under the President's FY25 budget request. To include background security investigations, the consumer's office's discretionary budget, and contract support for the inspector general. Uh, I need to go two slides. Get one behind me. Uh, you need two to go forward. two forward, please. Yes. The mandatory standards table summarizes the staff proposals for the commission's major rulemaking activity, most of which continue existing projects and new activities. Next slide, please. Our second op plan scenario supports the FY25 budget 
level of 183.05 million, of which 4 million supports uh, 2 million for each of the VGB and CO alarm grants. The remaining 179.05 million supports 607 FTE, a restoration of 73 FTE from the CR level and adds 14.4 million of non pay to the CR level and is inclusive of 3.2 million for the seven remaining ARPA recurring projects. Funding at this level would provide 3.9 million to include seven FTE for the restoration of port investigators at critical ports of entry to identify and address evolving needs of de minimis shipments, 5.9 million to include 25 FTE for compliance enforcement, specifically field staff, expand e-commerce, defect investigations, and restoring support for litigations. 11.1 million to include 22 FTE to restore the Office of Risk Reduction ability to investigate new existing and hidden hazards for future rulemakings. 2.5 uh, million to restore the Office of Communications Development and Implementation of a Customer Education Campaign specifically targeting chronic hazards, as well as expanding outreach to targeting uh, to targeted demographics. 7.45 million to include 13 FTE to restore the previously mentioned reductions to agency management, IT, and operations support projects. 400,000 for two FTE for international programs to continue emphasizing product safety cooperation with counterpart agencies in key jurisdictions regions, as well as with relevant multilateral organizations. And then $800,000 for four FTE to aid the Office of Inspector General in providing agency oversight. An appropriation at the request of FY25 President's budget level would enable CPSC to not only restore FTE and enhance agency capabilities, but also expand and strengthen its operations. The president's budget scenario would significantly bolster agency efforts to reduce the prevalence of hazardous products in the market, ensuring greater safety for consumers. If we were to receive an appropriation between the operating plan funding levels, we would come to the commission with a prioritized list of actionable items that conforms to the priorities of the FY25 president's budget. Thank you for your time this morning and happy to any questions you may have. Thank you for both. Uh, at this point in time, we're going to turn to questions from commissioners. Ten minutes uh, with multiple rounds if necessary. I'm going to start with myself. So again, thank you to the presentation. I recognize this uh, proposal comes from all the staff because it represents all the work of the agency across the board. Um, parts of it were disturbing. I think it's worth just noting that again, it's back in uh, FY 2023. The agency was better postured for tackling uh, tackling the growing risks associated with product safety because at that point in time we got a bump in our appropriations, and also had ARPA funds that we were using to the fullest. Um, since that time, our appropriations have been essentially flat, but flat doesn't mean that we can do the same things. And essentially, they've been functional cuts to our uh, the work that we've been able to do, and I know that. Um, both Ms. Schlick and Mr. Carroll, you talked about some of those, uh, the, the things that we're not going to be able to do, even though we're running at the same um, ostensible funding levels. But maybe, Mr. Schlick, you can expand on that a little bit more. Uh, yes, Chair, this has always been bothering me quite a lot. So I actually I jotted down just some things you know, off the top of my head and, and you know, 11 things that come immediately to mind. Um, uh, fewer port inspections and interdictions of hazardous products. Fewer field inspections to identify violative sales. Reduced ability to investigate and prosecute regulatory violations, civil penalties, and substantial product hazards. Uh, our ability to process samples of the laboratory is becoming a limiting factor in our ability to conduct investigations and, and prosecute violations. Uh, we're falling behind on, on replacing obsolete laboratory and field equipment. Uh, our development proposed and final rules is delayed. Uh, we're essentially suspending work on investigating chronic hazards like PFOS. Uh, we're unable to apply machine learning to data sets that could be used to identify hazards. Um, we are slowing our system security improvements. Uh, we're not able to post additional historical materials that would be of interest to the public on our website, uh, and we're unable to timely post new materials from the Commission. And uh, we are limited in our ability to develop and test internal controls. So there are many others Rob mentioned, uh, some of the things that we could do with increased funding, but those are just, just a few. Yeah, I mean, from that list, it sounds like it's touching every aspect of the agency, so it's not as if some are being held whole while others are having to retrench. 
but it's across the board where we are having to absorb these um, functional reductions. Um, if funding was at a higher level, we're taking a higher level appropriations and the, um, the CR level, you know, specifically look at the budget request that we did and our budget presence request, what would, if you can expand a little bit more on what would you be able to achieve under the circumstances? Sure, uh, if we were at an intermediate level, uh, then uh, we would uh, allocate funds in accordance with the president's budget request, which was approved by this commission. Uh, and we would expand our, our investigation and enforcement capabilities. Uh, we would uh, be able to upgrade equipment to the lab and to, to use it uh, to do investigations of chronic hazards, for example, uh, and other emerging hazards. We'd be better able to identify new risks, uh, both to, to drill down on risks that we have ourselves identified and to use tools to identify risks that we're not seeing now. Um, we would be able to deliver more quickly uh, the rules that are on the Commission's agenda and uh, you know, do more thorough uh, uh, assessments behind them, uh, which ranges all the way from economics to, to chemistry. Um, so those, that's the sort of work uh, that additional funding would allow us to do. And that in 2023, I'll just, just say that uh, 2023 was in recent years a high point in terms of agency funding, and it was also a high point in terms of agency performance. We uh, dramatically increased uh, our ability uh, and our production across virtually all metrics directly due to the funding that Congress provided uh, from 2021, 22 up to 23. Uh, okay. So I'd summarize for you and say the American public will be safer with additional funding for the agency. I think we return to the, the public and taxpayers a tremendous value for the work that we do and every shot that we get that is above um, our current funding. I think we would be able to make sure that the public is safer. Um, so I appreciate that and appreciate you thinking creatively and the hard choices that we're going to make up here in terms of how we're going to use the limited dollars that we're receiving. But despite the funding reality, there, there is good news in the document as well. I wanted to ask about a couple things. First, uh, I'd like to highlight that the the nice uh, program and the systems used to track injuries and trend uh, injury trends and understand hazards. And this largely relies on samples from participating hospitals, uh, providing us with data that we can use to make statistically valid national estimates. Um, teams have been working to recruit new hospitals, uh, and we were able to recruit nine in 2024, and are planning to recruit nine more this fiscal year. At the same time, we've also been piling in a program to access death certificate data years earlier than we would be able to, to do in the past to be able to get ahead and be able to track those trends. Can you talk a little bit about what this means for our mission to have a robust, nice uh, system and the earlier access to death certificate data? Mr. Boniface. Sure, I'll take that one. Uh, thank you. Uh, so our, uh, we're, we're a data-driven agency, and NICE is central to our uh, mission of uh, advancing safety. It provides us the ability to identify emerging hazard patterns and trends, uh, and the ability to make statistical estimates of those uh, consumer product-related hazards. Uh, that helps us, again, identify things we uh, should work on, can work on. It also helps us identify uh, or evaluate our effectiveness. Uh, on the death certificates, uh, again, it's an important uh, data feed for us. We're, we continue to look at uh, death certificates to inform um, everything from compliance work to rulemaking to voluntary standards, uh, information and education campaigns. Uh, with the electronic delivery of death certificates that we started uh, in fiscal year 2023, what that allowed us to do is it gives us a reduction of up to two to three years in the timeliness of those uh, uh, time to get those certificates. That significantly advances our ability to do uh, detection of emerging hazard patterns and trends. It get, getting the data earlier also helps us to um, and not only detect those emerging hazards, but getting them in machine readable format, uh, as we've set up, allows us to invest in machine learning to again reduce uh, uh, timely the time required to get to uh, the identification of a hazard, uh, as well as uh, uh, setting us up to reduce manual coding of those data streams in the future. Try. I would just add that working with uh, EXRR, we've uh, and the agency who who provided the funding, we 
the first week in November, we will finish deploying the WebNICE program that I'm sure you're most of you are aware of, replacing what was previously known as PC Nice, uh, which was worked on an individual laptop. Now it's a web-based program, which will allow, uh, we think will allow some efficiencies to be gained, such as uh, coders using the hospital system and the browser they have there to do cutting and pasting between the applications they're using in the hospitals and WebNice versus having to rekey everything on a, a separate agency laptop. So it has been a, a, a a little bit of time coming, I think it's fair to say, uh, but uh, in November, um, the first week in November, we will onboard the rest of the coders uh, for using WebNice. Thank you. I would say also the, the ability to track these trends is critically important as we were looking at, as you said, Mr. Boniface, the work that needs to be done both in the volunteer standards um, arena to be able to highlight trends that we're seeing in injuries and deaths, and also to the mandatory standard side as we um, move forward to make sure that the, the public's protected and to be able to establish standards in that area, as well as um, with respect to the work, um, Mr. K, that you do uh, be able to identify specific product defects that are out there. Now I'm running down on time, so I'm gonna turn to my colleagues. Commissioner Feldman, do you have questions? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And first, I'd like to thank all of our presenters for today's briefing. Uh, I also want to thank all the agency staff uh, who worked to put together this draft operating plan for fiscal year 2025. Uh, in particular, I want to recognize the work of our executive director, Austin Schlick, who managed the Vera VSIP program and the recent reorganization efforts to put CPSC on a more stable footing for this fiscal year and beyond. Uh, our, our efforts here occurred at a critical time as CPSC exhausted the $50 million in ARPA funds that the agency received from Congress to address pandemic era management challenges. I worked to direct as much of those funds as possible to expand our port and field inspectors uh, consistent with congressional direction. Uh, as our ED said, uh, and I agree, our, our people are our most important resources. Uh, I'm pleased that we've been able to bring these positions within our annual appropriation, which creates additional certainty uh, and stability to all of those teams. Uh, it also reflects the important work that the ARPA hires are, are doing and continue to do on behalf of the agency and, and for American families. Uh, I know that many of our port and field personnel are watching the briefing today, and I, I wanna say specifically to you that we appreciate the work that you're doing uh, and recognize the contribution that all of you make towards advancing the agency's safety mission. Uh, Jim and Rob, uh, I hope that you'll pass that along to your teams. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, uh, and uh, I will start with, um, E-X-A-R-R, -R. It's, uh, it's refreshing that we're using uh, acronyms that, that, that actually uh, make sense. Uh, so risk reduction. Um, on the voluntary standards table, uh, item 79 includes other planned voluntary uh, uh, standards activities for swimming pools. Um, question whether this item includes uh, the ANSI APSC ICC4 standard for above ground swimming pools. Uh, residential swimming pools. I, I know that uh, uh, that body is working to address uh, risks associated with uh, reinforcing straps and belts. Um, is this uh, a voluntary standards activity that, that agency staff plans to support? Uh, sorry, yes, we uh, uh, we uh, plan on continuing our support in that, uh, in that standard development. And that's included within, that's included within in that, that particular line item? Correct. Perfect, thank you. Um, uh, uh, sticking, I, I think, with you on, on OS 16, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the KPIs, I think, are one of the most useful uh, uh, items in, in, in these annual operating plans that we put together uh, because it's the measure of our productivity and, and uh, the return on investment in, in many respects. Uh, that, that, that that we're making uh, in, into these various teams. Um, but on OS 16, the, the target number for work-related injuries and illness per 100 of the uh, uh, 5RP employees per year is set to be no more than four. Do you have a sense of how many injuries we've had at 5RP and why our goal should be anything less than 100%? Uh, sure, that, uh, uh, that, uh, level is set based on OSHA guidance for similar facilities, uh, uh, laboratory testing type facilities. Uh, we, uh, our goal is obviously to have that as close to zero as possible, if not at zero. 
uh, we do have, we are testing products. We are pushing products to sort of the, uh, uh, to test failure modes and so forth. So we do occasionally have injuries. Uh, I believe that this fiscal year, or excuse me, in fiscal year 2024, uh, we had uh, two such injuries uh, to staff members. Okay. Uh, that's unfortunate, but I appreciate the, 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 the answer. Um, turning to EXHR, uh, the new EXHR, um, uh, question uh, on OS 14, um, the performance measure, uh, what one of the performance measures for, for, uh, y your vertical, um, has to do with the average hiring score, uh, of, of, of uh, score for hiring manager satisfied with an applicant listing. Um, uh, and it's got a target of 7.5. I'm, I'm just curious. Is that, w w what does that mean? Is that 7.5 out of, out of 10? I'm sorry, Commissioner, OS 14? Uh, OS 42. 42, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. And I'm sorry, that, uh, which number was that? Um, on OS 42, it's uh, uh, the, the listing the, for the average uh, uh, score of hiring manager satisfied yeah. with the applicant. Got it. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. So, can you repeat your question, Commissioner? I'm sorry. So, the, the, the key performance metric has to do with the average score of hiring manager satisfied with the applicant listing. And it lists a target of 7.5. And I'm just curious what that 7.5 means. Is that 7.5 out of out of 10? How are you calculating uh, what, 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 what that score 7. is? 7.5 out of 10 oh, is okay. what we're calculating. That yes. makes sense. Thank you very much. I, I have no additional question. Commissioner Tucker. Thank you. Um, and appreciate the information on the agency's budget situation being abysmally low, which is very transparent to us here. Um, and the fact that you ran through the fact that this means we're only going to be able to address a fraction of the problems facing American consumers from hazardous products. So I, I guess my question is, if we ever did get appropriate funding levels, something like NHTSA or FDA comparable mission agencies, um, we would have a much longer to do list. We would be able to put forward many more mandatory standards, for example. Is that fair? Uh, that is fair. Yes. Uh, and I'd, I'd say you know, we would still uh, examine the proposal with the same rigor that that we do, but but uh, we believe that there is room for this agency within the mandates of our statutes uh, to do more. And what I mean is, there's standards yeah. that we know about right now that with more funding we could be addressing right now. Yes, with and and should be addressing under under our statutory commands. With mandatory standards, right? Uh, Including mandatory standards, we typically begin with voluntary and and move to mandatory if necessary. Appreciate it. Um, and then just looking at the mandatory standards table on OS 18, um, I wanted to ask a, a, a question about some of the 104s, uh, Section 104 rules that we have there for bouncers, inventory, throw, swings. Those are listed as DATR, data analysis, technical review, again, this year. They were last year. So I wanted to get a sense of what work we did last year and what work we plan to do this year on, on those. Uh, sure, I'll take that one. Um, uh, so we, uh, uh, we have been working uh, on the underlying voluntary standards with ASTM on those particular issues and particularly focused on the firmness. The, uh, uh, we sent a letter to ASTM with some research that had been conducted back in uh, 2023. Uh, uh, spurred on by that staff request, ASTM has established a working group to establish a new standard test method for firmness of infant products. We are working in support of that. Uh, that standard uh, looks to cover a range of products, uh, including those listed as DATR on the table. So we're working with ASTM to uh, uh, and strengthen that or develop that standard and develop a strong standard, uh, look to deploy that in the individual product standards, uh, and then we'll look at uh, rulemaking when resources permit. Okay. And understanding that we don't control the timelines on that process, but, but we're sometimes aware of them. Do we expect volunteer standards for those for in that in that that space within this given fiscal year? Uh, we are hoping that they do, but as you know, we do not control uh, ASTM timelines. Okay. 
Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, chronic hazards, which has been discussed as an area that, that um, we should be addressing, and we're not always able to do a ton there. So I'm really glad to see proposals in this package to keep some momentum going in that space, particularly the lead reassessments in children's products and paints. I'm happy to see that proposed in here. It's work that we need to be doing. Uh, and we have a PFAS contractor report going on that is highlighted in the report as well. Just wanted to see if you could describe the work being done in that contract and how that relates to any plans to uh, regulate chronic hazards of PFAS. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, in fiscal year uh, 2023, we in, we initiated a contract uh, uh, to look at uh, uh, PFAS, uh, particularly looking at uh, hazard exposure information and to do a screening level risk analysis. That screening level risk analysis uh, is anticipated to be completed in this fiscal year. We will look to uh, publish and post that uh, when completed. We are working with ASTM on uh, some test method methods there, um, and we'll look to reassess uh, where we're at once we get the results of the contractor research. Okay. Um, now, despite the resource constraints we've been talking about, we, we do have some important rules on our agenda, and I'm excited about that. Um, some, but not all of those important rules are listed on page OS 14 as priority activity. Um, I don't know how that list was created, and I do just want to point out uh, no question on that, Austin, but but just that, you know, there are other rules in this package that are as important to me as any on that list. So for me, at least, that is not an accurate reflection of the relative priority of the rules among us. Um, yeah, I would just confirm that that's intended to be examples and by no means exhaustive. I appreciate that. Thank you for the clarity. Um, on the voluntary standards table, there are several new items mentioned, and Mr. Boniface, I appreciate you circulating kind of a, a key as to what's new and what's what's you know uh, consolidated. Uh, I was hoping you could tell me a little bit more about the hydrogel projectile slash non powdered guns. Um, what, what's the scope of that? What what's going on there? Uh, sure. So the uh, on the hydrogel projectiles, we're working with uh, ASTM. They have a new effort uh, to develop standards for. It's basically the uh, a new version of airsoft uh, guns. They use uh, hydrogel projectiles. Um, that has our interest from two dimensions. One is there's an obvious water bead dimension as as we're working uh, uh, on with both voluntary and mandatory standards. Uh, but there are issues such as uh, velocity of the pellet and so forth that uh, we also have concerns about. And, and any uh, marking issues? I know that we got that. Uh, there's yes, there's the uh, the marking issues for uh, that are required for. Uh, toy guns and and so does the non-powdered guns mean to just describe those hydrogel projectiles or is that a more uh, a larger category it's a larger category um you've got a range of <clears throat> mechanisms and and devices that uh, that that covers beyond just hydrogel but um you know pellet guns airsoft and so forth okay um and i'm i'm happy to see that we're addressing products that affect wildfire i just want to note that i support that work i think that's a good idea um, weighted infant blankets is also on our voluntary standards chart. And at the last priority hearing, uh, there were a number of participants in that voluntary standard that raised concerns about how it was going uh, with their treatment, with, with certain concerns about the process and with the progress it was making. I'm still concerned about how it's proceeding. And what I'm curious about specifically is, do you expect that voluntary standard to be one of the ones that we count on the list a voluntary standards that results in a positive safety change this fiscal year. Uh, so there are two voluntary standards on the, on the voluntary standards table, and uh, uh, the one I believe you're referring to is actually wearable infant blankets. Yes, that has as a subcomponent, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, weighted blankets for infants. Uh, there's another separate weighted blankets for ages three and up. I meant, I meant the first one. You're okay. right. Uh, so, uh, on that 1st, 1, uh, we continue to work with ASTM. Uh, they have uh, made uh, several attempts at ballots. Um, I am hopeful that they get to a standard this year. I do not know at this stage how much detail it will have on the weight issue, uh, given some fundamental uh, 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 information uh, elements, but we'll continue to work with them to try to get as strong a standard there as we can. Okay. Um, and then on that point, the list I was just talking about. So last year we participated, we had listed participation in 88 voluntary standards. 
with a goal that 20 result in positive safety change for consumers, which I thought was a great measure. Um, this year, you're asking to increase the list to 92 voluntary standards while lowering the goal to only 19 that result in safety improvements. Why would we agree to, to lower that goal? Uh, I think that the reduction in that goal is uh, a function of the resources uh, we have available. We we took a look at prioritizing, particularly with, with the very limited staffing, uh, prioritizing our work on mandatory standards, on uh, data acquisition, integration analysis, support for compliance and import surveillance. And when you start looking at how do we allocate a an almost 10% reduction in staffing, it, it, it becomes difficult to maintain all uh, frankly, impossible to maintain all target levels uh, with that reduced resource. So, so that makes perfect sense. If we're going to spend less time on voluntary standards, is that what that means? That we will spend less staff time on voluntary standards? Uh, yes, I believe overall there's a reduction. The number of voluntary standards in the table increased. Uh, a good portion of that is due to uh, accounting. It was uh, accounting for time that, quite frankly, should have been accounting for in the past. Items such as garage door operators and so forth, we've worked on. They're part of our mandatory standards. We need to continue to work on all, actively engage on all voluntary standards for which we have a corresponding mandatory standard. Uh, so the, the big change there is reflecting uh, uh, more accurately accounting for those. Okay. Uh, Mr. Schlick, one one more question with my time expiring here. Um, the commission previously decided to make monthly progress report data on recalls publicly available, including date, um, details on consumer you know, uh, response rate to the recalls, but we're not yet providing complete information to the public, it, it wouldn't seem. So what are we planning to do this year to improve how we make that data public, uh, particularly for recall response rates? I, I, I'm going to hand it. I'm going to hand it over to to Rob. But, but just I, I would note that we've had a substantial increase in the information that is available to the public uh, within the last 18 months. We've really made made major strides in that. So I just want to note that before. Andrew, yeah, I mean, I can address it from a in terms of a, a frequency standpoint. We've made some changes this year to try and improve the efficiencies with which data can be pulled and posted. And I think we are aiming to have more frequent postings in the in the current fiscal year. You know, in terms of the content, you know, I would, you know, refer back to, to Austin and to general counsel because a lot of those calls with respect to what data can be released are really um, uh, legal calls. Thank you. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the staff for your hard work in putting this document together. I really do know how much goes into it, uh, and so thank you uh, very much for that. Um, on the mandatory standards table, Mr. Bacchus, I want to say I'm pleased to see uh, that there's work seems to be progressing on e-bikes, uh, which currently are regulated under traditional bike standards. Can you just describe a little bit what the scope of that is and what progress has been made uh, since we last met on that a year ago? Sure. Uh, 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 that effort, we had the AMPR last fiscal year. Uh, we have been uh, taking advantage of the comments provided uh, to sort of hone our thoughts there, uh, as well as looking at the at further data analysis on uh, on uh, hazard patterns and trends. Uh, we've done a couple of studies on uh, 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 this is heavily focused on the mechanical aspects. We've done some studies on breaking, robustness, conspicuity, and, and so forth. And we're looking to bring all that information together in an NPR this, this fiscal year. Okay, well, thank you. And again, I do, uh, you know, I've been strongly supporting uh, looking at e-bikes as a separate category. So I was pleased to see that on the table and look forward to hearing uh, how it progresses. So thank you very much for that. I have uh, another question. I think I'm gonna have to call Ms. Davis up to, uh, up to the table because it's OCM. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the work that your office has been doing uh, and other offices, obviously, on translating recalls into Spanish. And I'm just wondering if you would uh, take a moment to explain how the ongoing commitment to translating recalls is reflected in this operating plan. Well, we are now translating all um, recall and unilateral releases through the State Department. Um, we anticipate being funded through ARPA for fiscal 
2025 once the funds are released from Treasury, and then they will need to be obligated and released. Um, but that's our plan going forward. Okay, and can you tell me what the approximate cost of uh, translating recalls through that mechanism that you just identified? Sure, we're still waiting for the final bills to come in for fiscal 24, but it will be around 70. $70,000, we do anticipate going forward, if we have more recalls, more unilaterals, that that cost would increase. Okay. Um, so, as I understand it, just uh, if I can walk through it with you for a moment, um, the translation service was essentially forward funded, correct? Yeah. Is that right? No, that's not correct. Um, it's ARPA funding. So ARPA funding will, will have to be obligated in fiscal 25 to pay for 2025 uh, translations. Okay, so is there a mechanism that we should be thinking about now, though, to go forward? Well, going forward in 2026, we won't have ARPA funds any longer. And so we will, um, you know, given that our budget and we anticipate to be deeply cut, um, we will need the commission to approve extra funds for uh, the next fiscal year to continue doing our translations of recalls and our unilateral safety warnings through the State Department. Okay, you're saying it's probably north of 70,000. Okay. Yes. Um, and maybe this is for you, Mr. Schlick. Do we have in-house capabilities to uh, handle this if we're given the limited resources we've been hearing about and this important work that uh, is um, perhaps not going to be able to be uh, addressed? Uh, very limited. And first, for the record and for the public, let me introduce Patty Davis, uh, Deputy Director of our Office of Communications. And thank you, thank you, Patty. Um, uh, we have uh, very limited internal resources. So when we're talking about translations of recalls, for example, um, the text of those recalls is negotiated with firms and provides very carefully worded uh, safety information for consumers. And we need to be sure that we're getting any translations exactly right, which is why we have been relying on the State Department, which has a really robust uh, mechanism, a, a translator, a reviewer, that they do a very, very good job. Uh, we do not. I'm sure they do. Uh, uh, with, other agencies, is that how our sister agencies handle this issue? They all work through the State Department? I'm sure not all work through the State Department, but many do. It's a broadly, it's a broadly available uh, service uh, with which we've had good experience. Um, um, so, you know, to have that quality of translation, we're really talking about agency funds rather than personnel. Um, we don't have a staff of dedicated translators. Um, I don't know that there would be sufficient full-time employment for a professional translator at, at the agency. But uh, so we, ha we have been quite pleased with the State Department service. Okay, but you are assuming there it, it, we all agree how important this is. There, are, what are the con uh, thinking about the contingency plans once ARPA funds run out? I, I Absolutely. Okay. Yes. All right, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Davis, for coming up to the table. And thank you all for the hard work you've done. Commissioner Ziak. Yes. Thank you to all the staff here today and all of those who participated in the preparation of this document. Um, uh, first, an observation. We heard a lot about the scarcity that is presented by this uh, operating plan. Uh, I'm an economist by training, uh, a, a lawyer by uh, demand, and one of the basic issues of economics is unlimited wants and limited resources, and this is a study in that. I've heard a great deal about FY23 as the, uh, the pinnacle of our budget, and that's true, but I did a calculation, and I don't have it in front of me. Uh, perhaps Mr. Kell can confirm this, but over the past four to five fiscal years, we have increased our, I'm sorry, Congress has increased our appropriation of roughly 3.7% amount, which I think is always a good baseline. Why do I mention that? In the document, and this has been a recurring frustration of mine, we cite to the President's budget request of $183 million and some change. We know as of early August that the Senate Appropriations Committee has budgeted or has, has appro appropriated by a 27 to nothing vote, roughly $162 million, which I think should be the high point in this budget, which would give us a better idea between the CR operating amount and, and where Congress may go. The uh, House budget is roughly $20 million below the, the Senate mark. Uh, and, and so that would give us a better idea and Congress a better idea as they work through the appropriations process 
as to what we would do with those dollars. Okay, uh, setting aside my budget committee staff director hat, uh, I wanted to go through, and some of these questions are for my own education. Some of them are having dealt with this document now, uh, uh, first as Commissioner Feldman's chief counsel and now sitting here. Uh, it is always a difficult document sometimes for me to read, and I'm sure that is true of our stakeholders in the public. So I am going to ask some questions about some of the, the proposals. First, I'd, I'd look to OS 18 and the mandatory standards table. And in there is the section 104 of CPSIA, uh, which is generally durable infant products. Uh, also included, and I believe I understand why, is the ATV uh, other line for DATR. Uh, Executive Director Schlick, could you, or perhaps Mr. Boniface, uh, explain exactly what that will involve? So I'm sorry, your question is on the ATV. What is that work going to entail? Right. So that uh, the DATR there represents that we are uh, working on some of the underlying technical research to the extent resources are available, largely staff resources, and that's focusing on uh, the stability uh, of these vehicles. And that's included because that, that the study of that was part of CPSIA, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. That was again for the general public wondering why these are not children's ATVs that we're dealing with. Got it. Um, Commissioner Feldman asked, uh, and I, 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 I'm happy to hear that in our voluntary standards work, we're going to continue that work on those particular types of pools. Uh, and I look forward to seeing the work on that. I'd like to see hopefully the voluntary standards uh, lead to something stronger with the uh, with that particular product. Uh, I uh, know, uh, and one of the things I have committed to focusing on is drowning deaths, which is the by far the largest cause of death among children ages 1 to 4, and the second leading cause between 5 and 14. And I know we're working with uh, uh, limited resources and constraints in terms of our messaging and uh, what we can do, and we need to be humble in terms of our ability to bend that curve down, but I want to work on that. And so I appreciate that work because I think that's something that we can specifically work on. Uh, turning to EXC, um, One of the things I didn't see in this, and perhaps I'm missing it, uh, several weeks ago, Commissioner Feldman and I uh, put out a press release uh, urging the commission, and I continue to urge the commission, and as I believe he does, to work on e-commerce and getting a better understanding of the various e-commerce sites. That is the future of commerce. It's not the future, it's the present of commerce, and I, I fear that we are, frankly, behind the eight ball on this important product or important distribution channel. Uh, and and I, I want to be fair and I want to make sure I understand what is contained in this that would deal with uh, addressing that component of distribution and retail sales. Thanks for the question. Uh, I, I think as, as, as the commission is aware, uh, through a variety of means, e-commerce has been a very high priority for our enforcement efforts. Uh, I would expect that would continue as we move into FY25 to the extent resources permit. I'm not gonna rehash what everyone has said about the impact that the reduction of resources has on everything. Obviously can't you know comment on any specific case or investigation, but I can say that, that we will continue to to look at uh, the places, uh, and particularly in e-commerce, from which uh, uh, violative um, or hazardous products are most likely to be found. To expand on that, though, a bit, I, my concern, and I want to be careful here, is do we have the understanding we need about the business models of the e-commerce channels? I understand how largely how brick and mortar uh, retailer operates. I'm not sure uh, as we see increasing numbers of e-tailers, as I'll, I'll refer to them as e-tailers, uh, what their business model is, where they fit within our regulatory framework. And I'm concerned that I didn't see anything in here, but maybe it's embedded somewhere that we are going to conduct work on that component of, of e-commerce? Well, it, it is a very fact-specific inquiry as it relates to any particular business. Uh, and for those businesses that we have reason to believe may 
uh, you know, or are, are worthy uh, of our limited resources to explore how they're operating so that we can make some determinations about their relationship to our statutory structure, then, you know, we'll, we, we're going to do that. Uh, I think it's, you know, as I said before, uh, I think over really the last five years, there's been a, a tremendous eff- uh, emphasis on focusing on the e-commerce aspect of all of our investigations and uh, resource permitting, I expect we'll continue to prioritize that. Thank you. Uh, I believe this is sticking with EXC, but uh, uh, perhaps we'll start with our executive director. Uh, and again, sometimes this can be a very dense read. Uh, but one of the concerns we've heard from Congress, frankly, from the GAO, from our outside stakeholders, and even within, I think we all share this concern is our recall effectiveness. Can you speak to where, what this document does or what our operating plan will do in the coming fiscal year with regard to improving our recall effectiveness? So, uh, one thing done by the commission at the mid-year, um, the FY24 mid-year uh, several months ago, uh, was to adopt uh, what we think is more accurate metric uh, for for assessing our success uh, there. Um, we are constantly looking, I'm going to, I'm going to hand to Rob, that we are constantly looking for new ways of communicating to the public and uh, having firms uh, do that as part of their corrective action plan obligations. Um, and you know, it really uh, there are two things essentially that we want to do. Uh, one is have a meaningful meaningful information and options for consumers and two is make them aware of that. So those are the two areas uh, that we're constantly working on and I'll, I'll uh, to Rob. You just, just to really expound on that, I think the commission's aware that we have really prioritized trying to get notice directly to consumers and we're also always looking to leverage new technologies uh, to the extent that 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 they further that uh, that goal, so where we can f- leverage the use of the product itself to announce its recall, that we can make use of, you know, referring back to the e-commerce discussion, leverage the fact that there's a lot more ability to contact people where there are e-commerce connections uh, through the sale, and you know, we continue in in every single corrective action to try and maximize that communication. I appreciate that, and my time is running short, so I'll, I'll, I would request a second round, but I appreciate the conversations we've had about using uh, things like smartphones and apps uh, to to to, to, uh, to conduct that outreach to, to reach those consumers. Uh, one can't help but walking around and see everyone looking at their phones consistently, and companies know how to market on those applications, and I was told... Uh, by a uh, software engineer uh, who works on these types of products on the app that uh, that sort of direct notice would not be technically uh, difficult to do. And so I look forward to working with with all, uh, all of our staff to to uh, to use that, but also to explore other ways to inc- to increase our recall effectiveness. As uh, I think everyone knows, we received uh, some information about a particular product that I won't say in public, but the recall effectiveness numbers were quite low and that is very concerning to me. And I know that's, it's not unique to that particular product. We have some great successes in some of the product recalls and less so in others. And I wanna work with outside partners, including academia and others who may have looked at this to to continue to focus on that part of it. And I wanna make sure that that's part of our next year operating plan. Thank you. I have a request for a second round of uh, questions. Now I'm turning in order. Thank you. I'll follow up on the uh, monthly progress reports that we were ended the last round talking about. And and you mentioned that some improvements are coming for this upcoming year. And I just wanted to check on a a few things. So are we planning to post uh, the recall response data for every corrective action plan that we enter into going forward? We, we, I, I believe we are. I think the issue is, is, is less about which, which corrective actions and more about. Uh, the data that we release with respect to each corrective action. Uh, and as to some parts of that data, there are certain legal obligations and certain rights that 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 firms have asserted with respect to that data. And we have processes for working through that uh, to try and maximize what we can disclose and to try and do it, um, you know, as efficiently as, as possible. And, and we, I saw you looking over our general counsel. We cannot get into that in this, in this forum, but maybe we should uh, in a private setting. Um, how frequently do you plan to update the NPR data online? 
you know, I, I think we I think we made two updates this year. I think we aspire to do more next year. But again, it's very dependent on on resources and on staff. It, it's amazing what a small number of people or a person can do to effectuate some of these programs. But when uh, when you don't have the ability to hire and you lose people, that can impact your ability to to deliver on this and everything else we've talked about today. So assuming that we can maintain what we have, then we hope to do more next year. Based on the answer to that, I, I fear the the answer to this next one. But uh, are we planning to improve the interface, or are we going to continue using a, an Excel spreadsheet to, yeah. to post of these? At this time, I'm not aware of any efforts to um, uh, to uh, to make changes or 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 to improve that. Okay, and and one follow up on the um, the Spanish translations that Commissioner Boyle was asking about. Um, one issue that that we had early on with the State Department contract was the very long lag times. We'd send them something, they wouldn't get a translation back for three weeks. Do we have an update on what the lag times are right now? Hi, Commissioner. Yes, it does remain about two or three weeks till we turn those around. But as our executive director was mentioning, I mean, the State Department is the gold standard of uh, translations. These recalls and unilaterals, uh, well, the recalls are heavily negotiated. We want to be mm. exactly right. It's not something we can just turn to Google Translate because it's not going to be as accurate as we would like. Okay. Um, uh some questions I had on um, our investments through our international programs department in foreign governments and manufacturers. Um, and on OS 30, there's a desire to fund eight different in person or virtual events for foreign governments and 10 trainings for foreign industry reps. Now, I don't know if we're planning on actually doing those in person, but if we do, have we projected a cost element on those? Yeah, I'm going to call, I, I hope, on Dwayne Ray, uh, who is deputy executive director and uh, is is leading uh, the Office of International Programs. Uh, right, Mr. Ray, come on down. There Hopefully, he is. Hopefully uh, you can hear and see me. Um, yep. Great. Uh, as, since, since we do have a large number of consumer products that are imported, um, we do focus on educating foreign manufacturers on our regulations with a goal of improving uh, their product compliance with our safety regulations before they're imported and ultimately protecting uh, U.S. consumers. Uh, these training events uh, are primarily webinars focused on a particular product or region where we can provide the training with interpretation. So, uh, so that uh, is part of it. Uh, we also do conduct in-person training events with interpretation. Uh, last year, we conducted uh, an in-person training in China and Vietnam. Uh, based on the budgets this year and the costs associated with uh, the in-person, we don't think we could do more than one in-person event um, because, as you can imagine, um, not only the travel, but venue rentals, simultaneous translations, it can get really expensive to uh, to host those kind of events. Uh, we are able to do more cost-effective events with the virtual uh, environment. Uh, there's still cost of staff time and, uh, and translations, but it's much less uh, cost compared to the in-person trains. You said we did do one of these um, uh, in, in Asia this year. What was the cost approximately on that? Uh, it's I don't have the exact figure in front of me. Uh, roughly forty thousand range. I can get you the exact cost. I just I don't have it right in front of me. I, I'd appreciate it. And you know maybe we can follow up with whatever costs there may be on on in person versus virtual, so we can decide whether we need to put any guide rails on how we proceed here. Sure. Um, and then I guess I'd have a similar question. Would the answer be the same for, you know, you've got on page OS 56 um, descriptions of in-person work abroad uh, through four different programs, the European International Organizations Program, the Selected Asia Pacific Program, the Southeast Asia Program, and the Western Hemisphere Program. Uh, are there anticipated in-person um, events there and are there cost elements to those? 
We are primarily focusing on the on the remote events uh, across the board, as as mentioned. Uh, with the reduction in the in the plan budget, we just we don't have the money to to do the um, do those in person events quite as much. Okay, yeah, I, I'd ask if you could follow up with us and, and share with the other commissioners what whatever cost elements we anticipate on on the various options there. Okay. Um, and, and then the last one in that same category, OS twenty eight. There's a priority activity to fund production of videos for foreign manufacturers in foreign languages. And same question. I just didn't know if that was we hired a contractor and it might have a cost element or if we do it in house. Uh, yeah, that one um, again, it's the same kind of uh, approach. We've done um, a series of, uh, of, of videos primarily focused uh, at manufacturers and product developers in China. Uh, these are done in-house. It does involve uh, time from both uh, the international team, but also we do get compliance and EXHR staff help and also uh, uh, OCM supports in some of the video production on that. Um, those, are, uh, those are developed and posted on uh, something called Yuku, which is the Chinese equivalent of, of YouTube, but it's accessible from within China. Um, and we do review recall data and violation data uh, with with the Office of Compliance to focus on what areas we should, uh, we're seeing those violations and where we think we need additional training, you know, kind of get it right before it comes into the country. And that's the approach there. Okay. And, and you know, following up on a similar concept here, I, I absolutely support us learning from what's happening abroad um, so that we can avoid duplicative efforts, get good ideas. And, and that's why the commission added a requirement to update us on relevant foreign regulations. Um, given that you're new to wearing this hat, it might not be a fair question to you, but, but maybe you know the answer. Uh, you know, what have you been doing to update the commission on international rulemakings and what planned improvements do we have in that space this year? I would like to get back to you on that uh, if, if I could. Okay, anybody else, um, Mr. Slick, or should we wait? I think best to wait, thank you. Okay. I like off the cuff answers, so if you wanna just blurt anything out, go ahead. Um, uh, Mr. Jaholski, we, we can't let you get away without a question, so I have one for you. I see that we're scaling back our goals for import examinations this year. I support the heck out of the important work that you and your people are doing, um, so I wanted to ask, what's going on with that. Last year, we had a goal of 45,000 import exams and 12,000 de minimis shipment exams. And this year, those numbers are down to 38.5 and 10.5. And so why are we having to scale back there? Yep. Nope, you know, you're cut off. It's... <laughs> Hi, uh, Jim Jaholski, Director of the Office of Import Surveillance. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, it's a direct relation to staffing reductions. Um, with the staffing cuts uh, this year, we are losing six uh, port investigators. Um, so obviously you need the boots on the ground to do the exams. And so what we have done is looked at, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna keep going. Okay. Um, what we've done is looked at uh, the productivity of our field staff. Um, and then just um, made reductions based on sort of the averages that we see that our staff produces in the field. Well, to, to our congressional appropriators, if you were waiting for a wake up call that you need to give us more budget, the answer to that question is it. We will have less people protecting our borders from dangerous products coming into our homes and harming us. And that should never happen. Thank you. Ms. Wall. I don't have additional questions. Thank you. Mr. Ziak. I, I do, uh, and I'll start with uh, Mr. Chaholsky uh, with the 57 FTEs. I appreciate the answer. Uh, Commissioner uh, Trumka just touched on some of the questions I was going to ask. Um, what was it? So I looked back, and it looked like in FY22, we were at 59 uh fts for port inspectors but it sounds like we had gotten above that in the intervening fy23 year is that correct what was the what was the the, the max capability 
I think in terms of staff at the ports, um, I think our high mark may have been 48 at the ports, which would have been uh, sort of the end of FY23, beginning of FY24. And I, I think with these reductions, we will be down to 42. And so the, the 57 combines the port inspectors and the field investigators, correct? That's um, the 57 is port investigators plus our targeting the analytical staff and supervisors. So it's the entire office. I appreciate that and, and appreciate that uh, you are going to be asked to do more with less, uh, unfortunately. Uh, that leads me to back to uh, to, to, to perhaps uh, Executive Director Schlick or, or, or uh, Rob Kay. Uh, in CPSA, I, I believe it was in CPSA, but our chair uh, can correct me if I'm in, if I'm wrong. Uh, there's a provision uh, under Section 24 of the Act which allows for stakeholders, in particular attorneys general, to assist in uh, our work. This year, in fact, this past July and August, we saw the state of Washington bring a case on lead in toys against the company uh, and reach a consent degree. I think in a time of scarcity of scarce resources, which we always face, those sorts of partnerships are valuable. And I think we don't do enough to rely and expand on them. And I'd like to know perhaps in this document or perhaps elsewhere staff has planned outreach to organizations like the National uh, Attorney General NAG uh, or other similarly situated uh, uh, folks who can assist in this because that that state of Washington prosecution was a real eye opener. It shows that uh, many of those state states attorneys general who have consumer protection within their uh, uh, bailiwick can assist in the mission, particularly when we are facing the fiscal constraints we face. So. Yeah, well, we welcome collaboration. Uh, we welcome it particularly for the reasons you said, but we welcome it generally. I, 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 I did speak to uh, uh, the NAGS uh, at NAGS uh, recent conference in DC for uh, which was very well represented from uh, all the, the state's attorneys generals uh, uh, around the country and uh, spoke about the nature of the work we do, spoke specifically about section 24, welcomed uh, outreach to our office uh, and to me directly uh, to the extent that there was interest in doing uh, the kinds of cases that you described in in Washington. I actually had spoke to someone from that office uh, and uh, as well as uh, as other types of work uh, you know that we do where where states feel that they have sort of a nexus in their state, um, whether it be because of the location of a particular manufacturer or particular types of incidents that are are occurring. Uh, so we'd welcome uh, we'd welcome that partnership uh, to the extent that it uh, it can be developed. Do we have a formalized program for states attorneys general to contact the commission? Do we, we have a POC that we advertise to their their POCs that handle consumer product issues? I, I think generally the contacts have come through our regulatory enforcement division. Uh, that's generally where we've had the contacts. Uh, you know, I think I made clear at the conference that uh, that to the extent that there's any question about who or how to contact, to contact me directly. Uh, I think I also uh, mentioned the deputy director, uh, Jen Sultan, as a, as a direct contact. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm confident that where we get outreach from state's attorneys generals that we, we will route it to the right place to try and, and, and see if there's a, a you know, basis for collaboration. And also, since, since she's one table away, I'll speak to the general counsel and just note that the assistant general counsel uh, for litigation is also a point of contact uh, for uh, state attorneys general. But that's not a formalized program we have that we push out to the state AGs. That, that's something I'd like to work with staff on going forward because I think it's a powerful tool in the toolbox Congress gave us that we're not using quite as effectively. Commissioner Feldman and I have traveled uh, extensively in the past four years, and when we stop in a state capital, we always try to stop and talk to the governor's staff who handles consumer product issues and this, the attorney general's staff. And I, I think, and I don't want to speak for him, but I think we have found that that is an enthusiastic group when they find out about Section 24 when we leave those meetings. Uh, interestingly, Washington is not yet a state we visited, and they found it on their own with their own within their own state statute as well. Uh, again, so I'd like to hopefully see something more formalized. Uh, turning to uh, uh, and following up with Commissioner Trumpka's international programs and priorities. Get to the page questions. Again, we are in 
a, a, a period of, of scarcity. We're always in a period of scarcity. Uh, and I'd like to better understand the how we're measuring success. So we 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 have uh, a, a number of programs, uh, particularly that are seem to be communications related. I am concerned that I didn't see a lot of communications related programs for older Americans, uh, which uh, has a those over according to our own data. I think it's over sixty five have a uh, almost double per one hundred uh, uh, injury rate. Um, and we are not necessarily, uh, this probably actually won't be a communications question. This is going to be more on the international programs. We're not necessarily doing as much as I would like. I, I know there's five of us up here, each of us with our own priorities. Uh, but one of the things, uh, uh, one of my former bosses always said, if you can't measure something, it's not worth doing. Senator Voinovich lived by that, that rule. And he was a executive as a mayor and as a governor and probably to, uh, to uh, many of our detriments as a senator, but it was something that always stuck with me. If you can't measure it, it's not worth doing. I'm not sure how we're measuring the success of our international programs, and that's not a that's not a criticism of our staff. It's a, a, an, a, a an appreciation for the challenge of how we would do that. But if we had those resources allocated elsewhere, particularly in terms of communications, I think they, in my view, would be better used, or at least we could get closer to measuring success versus failure on those types of products. But let me, I'll, I'll go to the question because I, I think our executive director wants to a answer it. Uh, are, are we measuring success? And if so, how? Yeah, it, it obviously is is difficult. I'm, I'm now talking about trainings in particular, but uh, the metric that we look at uh, principally, uh, in addition to obviously attendance is is, is when you're know, uh, in person and and uh, uh, and virtual, uh, but we carefully monitor um, hits on our website and use of our regulatory robot from the relevant uh, domains. Uh, so uh, we know uh, that after the Asian training that we mentioned, uh, we had a huge spike in traffic uh, from the geographies that we were targeting. Uh, and uh, you know, I, we can, we'll come back to you with the, with the exact number, but it was it was quite staggering. Um, so we do have a very good sense of whether our audience is responding to the trainings and we you know we'll get that within a few days. I guess the challenge I see is reaching out to our website is one measure. Ultimately the measure should be are we seeing reductions in dangerous product from those areas versus other parts of say if it's China for example. And I'm not sure maybe we are measuring that if we are I would like to see that because again if I have to, if, you know, if I were a king for a day and we're, we're pushing resources, I would probably push some of those communication resources to educating older Americans in terms of those types of dangers or working on uh, aquatic safety uh, versus some of these, which, by the way, I believe are largely available in the private sector. You know, there are law firms, there are consulting firms that do a lot of this work and that could do this for these companies rather than the, the taxpayer subsidizing that. But, yeah, uh, first I would associate myself with the all of all of the above. Um, I would I'd say we should be doing each of those things. Uh, but in terms of how do we track um, the ultimate success in making products safer um, for imports specifically that we're doing through the tracking of the Office of Import Surveillance. Um, and we know uh, we know our success in targeting volatile products through the risk assessment methodology. Uh, we know the countries of origin for the violative products. We know the uh, the proportion of products uh, that are coming from various jurisdictions. Um, so, you know, we, uh, and, and indeed we use uh, uh, information that we have about um, uh, the firms of origin, the testing labs of origin, the type of product um, to uh, build in the risk assessment methodology score that allows us to target. And we have really good success uh, at targeting. We have a very high hit rate. So. Um, really, the the prevalence of a factor in the risk assessment methodology is effectively a proxy uh, for uh, whether we think that that is an indicator of a violation. And you know, if we see a geography of origin uh, as being a scored factor, then you know we might we might, for example, focus more training uh, on that area. So it's, I think it's really a loop. But, but well, my time is up. But. Yeah, and we had a request for another round. Okay. So I'll, 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 uh, so starting the, the third round, uh, 
take a few seconds myself. I know that Mr. Ray, you're collecting data in response to a question from Commissioner Trumpka about the uh, trains that we've done overseas. In addition to the, that information he asked, I'd also ask if you can have a sort of a list of the participants, the number of participants who are in there, the type of um, people who were uh, getting that training to so that they can understand what our standards are. You know, and while I, I, I'm sympathetic with uh, Commissioner ZX, how do you measure? Fortunately, some of the things is if we stopped doing the trainings, the measurement would be an increase in dangerous products hitting our shelves and homes, potentially, which I think is also a, uh, we've got to balance out what those risks are as well. But anyway, um, turning to my colleagues, Commissioner Feldman, did you have a? Thank you. This question would be for Mr. Wright. Uh, w when we're in the process of standing up uh, trainings in foreign jurisdictions uh, uh, for domestic import requirements. Are we aware, do we keep track of whether reciprocal trainings exist uh, to the benefit of American manufacturers complying with foreign import requirements and, and, and foreign standards? Yeah, I, I'm not aware of that. I'd have to get back to you, check with the team on, but we definitely, as, as the chair mentioned, um, keep good records of what uh, what are trainings, who are participants, and what kind of uh, reach we got on that. Okay, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. No further questions. Commissioner Trumka. Thank you. And, and uh, <laughs> Commissioner Ziek, I appreciate your questions on uh, the international programs. Uh, I share some of your thoughts there, a lot of your thoughts there. And, and I think you're right that the ultimate measure isn't how many people sign up to watch a webinar, but will they stop sending dangerous products to our shores? And that ought to be how we're looking at that. So I definitely appreciate that perspective uh, and any ideas on how we get there. Um, and, and also agree with your perspective on the value of uh, state attorneys general. And, and I remember just one thing to toss in on that was um, when I was working as an assistant attorney general uh, for a state, there was, so you mentioned your NAG attendance and NAG also has a training arm, NAG tree, that goes in and trains line level AAGs. So those are the people in, in every state you might be able to get very interested if you show them a blueprint for how to bring one of these cases, uh, as opposed to talking to like higher level folks at the AG level or something, you'd be talking to the folks that actually would be bringing the cases. And it could be a really valuable and cost effective tool to ex expand our reach there. Um, and happy to continue exploring that as well, because I think it's a great idea. Um, uh, Ms. Davis, a couple of questions on communications. Um, it looks like we're lowering. So, so we have a, a performance measure and for our unique open rate for email subscribers uh, to CPSC's recall announcements. And that number last year was 30% as our target. And this year it's 24%. And can you address why we would be lowering that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the federal benchmark for the service that we use, Granicus, which is the email delivery service for all of the federal all of the federal government, the federal benchmark is 24%. And we, for best practice, we are recommending that we be in line with the federal benchmark. What did we hit last year? We're at tw uh, 2024, 28%. So we're better than the federal benchmark. Yes, we are. We shouldn't hold ourselves to their standard. Let's hold ourselves to our own. Well, it's very difficult to set a meaningful goal. Um, and we think it's best practice to be in line with other federal agencies. I, I would say best practice would be don't set a standard worse than we've already hit. So I think our floor should probably be 28, if not staying at 30. Um, but I appreciate that. Um, and then one minor question that I just didn't know what it was, and I thought you could help me with. On OS 55, there's a project uh, identified as 44795, and it, it describes contracted media monitoring services. I got it. I wasn't really familiar with what that is. Can you describe what that project is? Right. I believe that is um, our, mel we have a, a contract with a contractor who provides media monitoring. Um, and so the, a media monitoring service is an essential part of any communications enterprise and really is a critical tool for uh, effectiveness of communication and outreach activities. Um, so it's pulling engagement data, which is one of our key measures that's reported to Congress. It's pulling impressions, which we report internally and oh, other see. measures. And uh, we're actually getting real-time access to stories um, that that air or stories in print that we can turn around quickly. Okay, that, that's more involved. When when I read that, I was wondering if this is just us automating 
searching for what articles are out there. It's not that. This is more data driven. Okay. Um, and then uh, one other question I had, and I'm not sure if this would be, well, I'll let you decide. Um, we've made great improvements that recently on our website design and modernization, uh, which are very much needed and appreciated. And we've made it more user friendly as a result. And I'd really like to see where else we can use those lessons learned, how we can expand what we've done there into other areas. And, and one area that really jumps out to me is say for products.gov. And I've tried to report a hazardous product on there. And I know there's a, a number of roadblocks you hit in that process. There's a number of things that could scare off consumers in terms of a bunch of warnings that say, hey, we're going to tell the company everything about you and they're going to contact you and things like that. I, I wonder if we've considered whether we're going to try to make any improvements to the user friendliness of saferproducts.gov in the upcoming year. To any of you, the, the, but I also said it's one of the most lawyered up websites you will ever find. We need to uh, that. And that's, and Congress has, you know, Congress has told us to do it that way. So, well, let me ask a different question. Any unnecessary roadblocks? So, wherever that's the case, of course, you're not going to violate the law. But where there's things above and beyond, well, what could be roadblocks there from a user friendly standpoint? Are we thinking about how to improve those? Uh, yes, we did uh, do a review of that. I'm thinking about the 2018 timeframe. Uh, so, certainly would look to do that again. Uh, as Mr. Schlick noted, it is a very statutorily driven system. So, a number of the questions that the uh, reporter has to, a uh, consumer re making a report has to answer, has information elements that are established in, uh, in the underlying statute. So, uh, there are very, very significant limits on. Well, I saw Mr. Burnett uh, standing up, and I have to imagine there are ways to present information differently from, from a user-friendly standpoint. So whether you have to say a certain disclaimer, is it a pop-up ad, is it at the beginning? I mean, there's, there's things in there. Could we, could we make that more user-friendly and, and less scary? Yes. Uh, and, okay. uh, and I will say that Pam, who couldn't be here today, has reached out to our office to talk to us about when we can engage in an internal effort to improve saferproducts.gov because as you probably know, we don't have external funds for a redesign as we did for the major website. Uh, but she reached out to us at the beginning of the, the fiscal year and we are going to figure out how we can support her to do that. So, so there are plans to try to do this internally this year? We are gonna try our best. Yeah. I, I really support that. And if there's anything that you could use from us, um, please reach out and let us know because I think it's a really great idea. I'm glad you're already talking about it. Yeah. I think we need to do it. So thank you. Absolutely. Okay, can I grab three seconds of yours? You can have the remainder of mine. It's all yours. Mostly with just a comment I was going to make. When we're looking at um, uh, email opening rates, my understanding, and I looked at the, the statistic and also had concerns and some of conversations that understand this, the way that uh, some other agencies reach those numbers is to drop off emails that uh, don't open the, the emails on a regular basis, which means that functionally it would mean sending less of our safety alerts out to people um and it artificially that artificially increases the number of people who are opening up on a regular basis so i think that's a, a question of balance to be struck as well in terms of how to best uh, approach it and borrow some time back to ask that's you a follow-up um so so just so i understand that that's the other agencies are doing that to kind of juice their stats and their goal is still 24 percent if we're not doing that and we're hitting 28 percent then we're doing much better. Mostly just a comment in terms. No, no, I appreciate it. That, that's useful to know. Thank you. Commissioner Ball. I don't have anything else. Thank Commissioner Ziak. Uh, last couple of questions and then I will stop and turn uh, to, to the rest of the questions during OEX. Uh, Mr. Burnett came to the table, so I, I did actually at the back uh, have some comments. Uh, I, I, first of, of praise, I appreciate, I, I very much like the way that you presented the priority activities and milestones, uh, it was very cause to effect. So appreciate that. One of the things I'm glad we are going to continue to see is that migration uh, to SAS via, which my understanding is will help us with our data analysis and eventually using the, the ML uh, and eventually the uh, the AI to help uh, increase the efficiency of a lot of the different uh, tasks we have. Uh, so thank you for that. And uh, as I've said before, uh, IT, particularly in the federal government, is often one of the uh, things that is uh, first cut and last restored, uh, but we always complain about it. And I appreciate the work you and your team have done 
uh, when uh, the chair came on board, I, I joked with him and said, one of the things if you accomplish fixing our IT or at least making it better so we have less lost downtime, et cetera, and so forth, your term will be a success. And I think that has occurred over the past several years. So, so thank you for that. Uh, one of the things you talked about, and this will actually pivot to a question to, to Executive Director Schlick, is the continuity of operations plan or the COOP. You had mentioned that in yours. Uh, the, I believe it was the Inspector General noted the lack of a COOP in our uh, issues during the pandemic. My understanding is we now have a COOP, but we've not done, to my knowledge, a full commission COOP exercise. Uh, and perhaps that's because it's viewed as not necessary because we do have so much remote capability, but I'm not sure how that would factor into our port inspectors and our uh, uh, the, the folks who physically show up every day. So I would be interested in potentially having a COOP exercise conducted during the next fiscal year to test that capability. So we're not testing it in real time the next time around. And it looks like our, our associate executive director will answer that. I'll, I'll answer in the broader context and then turn it over to Brian for in, uh, information technology and its relationship to COOP. So we will begin updating our COOP in two weeks, actually with uh, with support staff, uh, largely framing it. And we will plan for at least one exercise in FY 2025 um, at the broader scale. But I'll defer to Brian to talk about how uh, information technology nests in COOP and the things that, that happen uh, particular to IT. Thank you, and I appreciate that we're gonna we're gonna do that exercise in 2025. I think one of well, two things. Uh, the first is we we did we ran eight major system tabletop exercises this year. The first time this agency's done that, we did a ninth, which was the privacy breach uh, exercise. First time we've done this sort of coop exercises at at the system level, and we do have a contingency plan, and the agency has a coop plan. The the trouble is they were kind of developed separately. Uh, and so what we and what the IG is focused on, what we need to focus on this year is creating more linkage between those system and those technical aspects and the business, those mission essential functions that you find in a COOP program to make sure those are linked together. That's one of our big challenges for this year. I appreciate the work, but both of you and your teams are doing on this and I look forward to, to continuing that conversation and again, doing that exercise. Thank you. No more questions. Thanks. And just to, uh, for the public, that was our deputy executive director, Annette Evans. Um, I don't believe we have any more questions at this point in time. I thank the staff for all their work in putting together the proposal and for the uh, engagement for my fellow commissioners. It's clear that we have work to do in terms of reviewing and um, making any changes to, to the proposal going forward. Uh, so thanks to, to you and also thanks to our facilities and communication staff and the Office of the Secretary for the assistance in putting the, this meeting together. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Need to say something all way nice. One of the issues is when you sit down at a table like this, I'm not going to be because my voice going to work when they call them. <laughs> so.